this anymore. I don't want to fucking do this anymore. Hello everybody and welcome back to Typical City. It's been a lot of moaning from Manchester City fans of late, but that was a reminder of how bad things actually can get being a football fan and it can get a lot, lot worse than that as well. So if you're pulling tantrums like that, then by all means, this game might not be for you. It might not be for you in truth, but it can get worse. It may still get worse for Manchester City because Selhurst Park is not an easy place to go. I hate going there. It's like Pep said, going to the dentist is like going to Selhurst Park and I've been to the dentist lately and it was shit it was crap really really bad so I don't want that experience I want to get there get the three points and get the hell out of there I don't want to be there it's never been an enjoyable place for Manchester City this fixture's been notoriously difficult our biggest win ever at Selhurst Park was in 2019 and that was 3-1 the biggest win ever you know, in terms of an actual scoreline, there was actually, those of you uh, will of course know this, who doesn't know this? February the 20th in 1926 in the FA Cup. There was a humdinger of a football match finishing 11-4 to Manchester City. And if you didn't know that, what rock have you been living under? Of course, everybody knew about that scoreline, but it is going to be a difficult game. There is no two ways about it. We haven't scored, uh, sorry, we haven't conceded a goal there though in the last four games. So we've done okay defensively, but even last season, Erling Haaland with a late penalty to make it 1-0 Manchester City. And that was in our treble winning campaign. And sticking with Erling Haaland, will he start? Will Alvarez start? Because he's failed to score in 12 of his last 17 matches for club and country. 12 in 17 matches without a goal for Erling Haaland. That's a bad run. For most strikers, for Erling Haaland, it's, it's desert land, it's wasteland, it's barren, you know? I, I, I still believe in the guy, but it's a bad run he's on right now. And we need to support him as City fans. We as the players as well, of course, they need to support him. Could we see those same level of crosses coming in from Doku on the right, Grealish on the left? Could we see that? Because there was a lot of crosses coming into that box against Aston Villa that I thought, that's Haaland's bread and butter. Where's that been lately? You know, and it was the wrong man on the pitch at the time. I think Alvarez doesn't deserve to be dropped. I'm not sure what Pep's going to do. I do have a, a my opinion is a, I'll give to you shortly in the video in the, my predicted starting eleven. But in truth, it's a, it's a tough decision to make for Pep Guardiola because Haaland's, like I said, no goals up in the last 12, 17 games, no goals in 12 of them. So that's not a good run at all. And the whole city tearing Cockneys apart again, you know, we, we do reasonably well in London, but we've kept one clean sheet in our last nine visits to London. And that was last season against Crystal Palace in the 1-0 win with that Erling Haaland penalty. So I, I'd take that right now. I would take a 1-0 penalty all day long. The, Crystal, the, the new Crystal Palace manager, Oliver Glasner has got five points from his first five Premier League matches, got off to an OK start, beating Burnley 3-0 in his first game, followed by two draws and then followed by two defeats. Most recently, they lost 1-0 on Tuesday night to Bournemouth with a Clivert goal. Um, that, that I felt like Bournemouth deserved that game. They're riddled with injuries. Again, City are getting a little dose of luck that I feel like we need to recognise that there were people coming at me after the um, in my player ratings. Like, why aren't you talking about the injuries for Aston Villa? I spent the whole preview, the whole game, and the whole watch-along and the match reaction talking about Aston Villa's injuries. It's just not good enough for some. People want me to just admit that we don't deserve to win. We fully deserve to beat Aston Villa, whether it was a weakened side or not. That's not anything we can do anything about. That is that. But, I mean, facts are facts. Crystal Palace, again, we're going up against a makeshift defence. They're riddled with injuries. We've got to make the most of this situation going up against this Crystal Palace side because it's not full strength. The issue is the front line. The front three are still going to be very, very dangerous and something to worry about. Crystal Palace haven't won in four Premier League matches, though, of course, so it's going to be a really interesting game. Currently sitting 14th in the Premier League. With no jeopardy, really. So are they comfortable, Crystal Palace? The, you, you can put two spins on it when you, when you look at things like that. When you're going up against a team that doesn't really have anything to fight for. They're eight points from safety. Very likely going to be in the Premier League next season. Crystal Palace, they're not really worried about relegation. They've got no European football to challenge for. They're out of all the cups. It's like, 
what do they have to fight for? That could bode well for City. It's like, well, there's no jeopardy. There's nothing to fight for, so we can beat them. But I'd argue that some players in particular, some teams maybe as a result, play their better football when they're calmer, relaxed. You know, nothing to worry about. No pressure. No jeopardy. This Crystal Palace side could knock it about and play some nice, composed, calm football. You know, whereas we've got everything to worry about. A Premier League title race that's going to be huge. One of the uh, title races for the ages. This Manchester City side going up against Liverpool and Arsenal. It's going to be a monumental title race. And one we definitely have the advantage on this weekend playing first. I will be doing a watch along, of course. It's a 12.30 kickoff in the UK. So come and join me for that one. But uh, in truth, it's, it's advantage City because effectively, depending on the goals, of course, I think we'd need to score four. I think we'd need to win by four. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. And drop a like as well while you're there and subscribe if you're new. All that bollocks that everyone seems to say on YouTube every five seconds. Um, if we were to go and get a comfortable win, we could. You know, I think it's four goals. And if we were to score a high-scoring game like that and beat Palace comfortably, we could go top you know, all the doom and gloom Manchester City fans, you know, we're one 90 minutes away from going top. Obviously, Liverpool and Arsenal will have the game in hand, but they're not easy games in hand. Arsenal have got Brighton away. Liverpool are going to Old Trafford. So, yeah, that's not that easy, is it? You just don't know with United, though. That's, that's the issue. I know what happened last night was an absolute catastrophe for United. But it's just straight, it's right, right up their street, isn't it? It's it's, uh, the epitome of Manchester United is to do what they did last night against Chelsea and then go and beat Liverpool uh, three or four days later. That is the exact thing that United have been doing for quite some time now. Ridiculous performances like that. They did it with the Liverpool game. And I can't remember who they played in the next game, but they went and lost that game as well. So they went from that. Was it Brentford? I know it was drawing 1-1, wasn't it? A draw, a, a pathetic 1-1 draw with Brentford. They, just, they got battered by Brentford. And that was following an unbelievable 4-3... FA Cup clash with Liverpool, you know, so <laughs> they seem to pick their moments, don't they, United, and I mean, I'm praying, I mean, I don't have a Manchester United shirt, shock, horror, but I mean, I will be supporting Manchester United in that game and hoping, praying that they can take anything off Liverpool, a draw would suit me very, very nicely, but um, the in terms of jeopardy, there's one issue for me is will Manchester City have one eye on Real Madrid, because I feel like this squad now is grown accustomed to the Champions League. It's going to be a really, really difficult task to win, or near impossible for Manchester City to win all three. A back-to-back -back treble is on. It's, it's, it could happen. Will it happen? Very unlikely, in truth. But you just never know. But with the taste, that we've got that winning taste now of the Champions League, the squad has. Will they have one eye on the Real Madrid game? And you can't afford to even think like that. You just can't. You know, will players go in a little bit tentative tentatively worried about getting injured for that Real Madrid game. They want to play. Of course they want to play. Um, will certain players play in this game knowing that they won't be playing in the Real Madrid game or vice versa? You know, will players be rested for that Real Madrid game? Like John Stones, for example, who's been on an unused substitute in the last two games. Could he be introduced into this game, which for me would be a high-risk manoeuvre from Pep Guardiola with Real Madrid round the corner, but then you've, you're losing that solidity. You know, Rico Lewis has done really well sitting in that midfield, but it'll be a third game in the row in, in a massive, massive game against a very physical Crystal Palace side for Rico Lewis, and physicality is probably one of his weak spots. So it's going to be interesting. Team news, Crystal Palace, here's all the injuries, they are riddled with them. Chris Richards picked up an injury, uh, couldn't play against Bournemouth, which saw Jefferson Lerma come in, of all people, going in at centre-back. They do have James Tompkins, Crystal Palace, that they could have played, but uh, Glasner preferred putting the number eight of Jefferson Lerma, who's a really good player, and dropping him is to the into the left side of their cent three centre-backs, which was an interesting move. Sam Johnston is another player that's injured. Czech Decore is injured. Mark Gay is injured. Rob Holdings injured. Raksak Kiesman injured. Matthias France is injured. And Mate uh, Matthias France, by the way, came on as a substitute in the at the game in the 2-2 draw at the Etihad and ran rings round Kyle Walker down that left-hand side. Palace's left-hand side, you know. He came on and he's a, he's a quality player, that front. So he looks really, really promising. And he came on, caused problems down that left-hand side. And it was down that left-hand side where Phil Foden gave that penalty away. And we ended up with a 2-2 draw. This bloody Palace side, man. We've, got, we've had nightmares against them. Last season, we went 2-0 down at home to them. And had to, thanks to an Erling Haaland hat-trick, we came back and won 4-2. 
You know, we can't afford to go 2-0 down in, in, in this game, you know, against a Crystal Palace side that's going to be... And Selhurst Park is a fantastic atmosphere, a really difficult place to go. And I don't underestimate this game, you know. The potential positive news for Crystal Palace is the return of Michael Elise, who returned to training this week. Whether he's going to be risked and playing ahead of the likes of Jordan Ayew and Eberechi Eze, debatable. I'm not entirely sure that's going to be uh, a, a risk that Glasner's one are going to use. Um, you know, they'd, I don't know whether they'll throw him straight in the deep end, having only just returned from that injury. City, Walker, Ake, Edison are still very much likely out. Unspecified Nathan Ake, so I don't know how serious it is, but I mean, even if it's close, I wouldn't risk him. I'd rather see Nathan Ake playing against Real Madrid in truth. Uh, and rested for this game. Walkers are almost definitely out. Edison is definitely out. But uh, so City are, are fairly well off when it comes to the injury side of things compared to Crystal Palace. We could say the same again before the Aston Villa game. So there are no excuses for Manchester City. We have to go to Selhurst Park and win. I don't care how we win. This is the when we play away from home in these this last eight games of the season. I don't care the performances away from home. I do care a little bit more about the the home performances. Because of the Champions League, you want to you carry those performances and, and have your home legs against Real Madrid and whoever we might face in the next round if we knock Real Madrid out. That matters. But away from home, it needs to be dogged. It just needs to be solid defensively. Let's keep a clean sheet. And we've not been doing that lately. Um, so, it's going to be really interesting. My predicted starting eleven, starting with Crystal Palace. Henderson in goal. Are they going to play James Tompkins? In that back line, I'm not sure they are. To be honest, I'm taking a guess here because I was I was completely dumbfounded at the fact that they played Jefferson Lerma as uh, as a centre back, and I have a feeling they might do it again. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. But I'm going to stick with what happened against Bournemouth and put Jefferson Lerma in there. Anderson um, came. He scored a goal last season at the, at the Etihad, didn't he? Big guy comes up for set pieces, a goal threat. Um, who else in the back three will be Joel Ward? And it'll probably be more of a back five in truth with Tyrick Mitchell being a, 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 a wing back. They, they've been playing a 3-4-3 three, three with, the, uh, with the front two of the three, outside two of the three, sorry, being very tucked in and narrow, allowing the wing backs to overlap. I can't imagine Palace doing too much of that this time round, but it'll be interesting. It will be interesting to see how they set up. They've got um, Daniel Munoz, who's been uh, introduced to the starting eleven for Crystal Palace lately. Then in front of them, we've seen Will Hughes, a familiar player, has been coming in instead of... He came in instead of Jefferson Lerma. And the new introduction of Adam Wharton, he's been playing for them lately as well. Um, tenacity between the two of them, solid. Solid two players that, you know, tough tackling, keep it simple, and it's exactly the sort of midfield that you're going to need to play well against this Manchester City side. Um, and then up front, Eberechi Eze on the, sort of on the right, a little bit tucked in with Jordan Ayew doing the same thing on the other side of the pitch. Just tucked in a little bit there with Jean-Philippe Matateur uh, as a centre forward for them, a big target man, similar to Erling Haaland. And speaking of Erling Haaland, will he start for Manchester City? That is a big, big area of the pitch that I think a lot of City fans are going to be curious about. Uh, Stefan Ortega in goal. I'm going to go Manuel Akanji as the right centre-back with Ruben Diaz in the middle. And Josko Gavardial, who's been brilliant lately. The last two games in particular, fantastic to see him hitting the heights that we want to see from him. Really, really good from uh, Josko Gavardial. I think Rico Lewis might be playing again, to be honest, because I can't see the reason why Kovacic might not play, because there's going to be defending to do. Do you want Kovacic to drop in to right back or to centre back? Because that's the role of this Rico Lewis role. He's got to drop into defence when we don't have the ball. Do you want Kovacic doing that? Alternatively, you play Kovacic and you ask Rodri to drop into centre back and then you lose that attacking threat that he's shown all season with an assist and a goal against Aston Villa. I think we've forced our hand here. I think it's going to be Rico Lewis again. Um, alongside him, the big man, the best man, the big and best man, I mean, arguably the best player in the world right now for me, 
people talking about Alexis McAllister. I mean, without even mentioning Rodri in the same breath is an, is an insult and a disgrace. McAllister's been fantastic, but Rodri's another level, mate. He's another level. Uh, could we see Kevin De Bruyne as well? That would be interesting. And I feel like he could play. With him being rested midweek, I feel like he could come in. That would therefore mean Bernardo Silva gets a rest, which I won't have a problem with because I don't think he did as well as he could do against Villa. Maybe a rest could do him good. We could use his energetic nature against Real Madrid, of course. And Phil Foden in the middle. I'm going to go with Jeremy Doku on the right and Jack Grealish on the left. Those two were fantastic against Aston Villa and I want to see more of the same. And I'm going to go with Erling Haaland up front. I know some people, that's my predicted starting eleven. I personally would probably give, if I had to pick, if it was my decision, I'd probably go 51 Alvarez, 49 Erling Haaland. Going off form, going off recency bias a little bit with the fact that I gave you that Erling Haaland's failed to score in his 12 of his last 17 matches for club and country isn't good reading. But you just don't write the big Nordic meat shield off. You don't. You just don't write him off. And this could be the game that we need him. And considering those crosses that were coming in from Jack Grealish and Jeremy Doku in the game against Villa, it's the sort of crosses that Haaland gobbles up. And we need it. We need it against Crystal Palace. Blues, what's your prediction? I'm going to go 2-1 to City. It's going to be a close one. You know, something, a fine detail will decide this game. It's going to be a tight, tight game. Watch your predictions. Get in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts. Like and subscribe to Typical City, and I'll see you in the next one. This is Typical City now.